So, Cryptosporidium. This video is a video all about Cryptosporidium, a full-on breakdown of everything from testing, the life cycle, everything you need to know as a keeper. Cryptosporidium is a protozoan parasite. Now, in snakes, it's normally Cryptosporidium serpentis. Normally in lepergeckos and lizards, it's normally Cryptosporidium varani. So the very first part of my research was the life cycle of the disease. So what I've done for you is fully animated the life cycle to make things much more easy to learn. So take a look at this. An oocyst enters the small intestine. These contain four sporozoites, which are the motile spore-like stage acting as the infective agent. The oocyst bursts and releases sporozoites, which then invade epithelial cells of the intestinal wall. This then develops into a trophozoite, which is the growing stage that absorbs nutrients from the host. This forms a type 1 merunt. Asexual division produces 6 to 8 nuclei. These then go on to develop into 6 to 8 merozoites. These are released to invade fresh cells and produce more type 1 merunts to continue invading other cells by making more merozoites. Or they can form type 2 merunts. Type 2 merunts form 4 nuclei. These form 4 type 2 merozoites, which in turn invade new cells. They either form male or female stages, mycogametocytes, which are male, or macrogamonts, which are female. The mycogametocytes divide into 16 before being released to fertile the female macrogamonts. Zygotes are then formed, which form walls around an oocyst with 4 sporozoites. About 20% of oocysts produced are thin-walled and reinfect more cells as self-infection while thick-walled oocysts are passed into the faeces to infect another host that comes in contact with the shedding host faeces. The transmission route of this disease is faecal to oral. Now it doesn't have to be just faeces, it can be contact with contaminated surfaces or objects, or just outright direct contact. Clinical signs. Tarek, as a vet, what clinical signs would you be expect to see with either of the species for Cryptosporidium? So, um, crypto can affect lizards, it can affect snakes, it can also rarely affect chelonians as well. So sometimes you get it in tortoises, but it's much less common. And depending on what species you see it in will dictate the clinical signs. Now, it also depends a little bit on what type of crypto you're dealing with, because some cryptosporidiums are what we call gastrotropic, and that means they live in the stomach. And so if you've got a gastrotropic crypto, you'll see signs which are related to stomach disease. And some um, cryptos are enterotropic, and that means they infect the small intestine. So for gastrotropic species, what we would typically see would be vomiting, um, regurgitation. Sometimes we may see a swelling of the stomach. So the classic sort of cryptosporidium that you'd get in snakes, I guess, is you'd go into a collection and the history would be that snakes are dying and a lot of them are regurgitating or vomiting. And you have a look at some of the snakes and the snakes are sort of perfectly straight until about the first third and then there's a bulge and then they carry on being straight again. And the reason you get that bulge is because you get what's called a hypertrophy, which is a thickening of the stomach wall, basically. So you get gastric hypertrophy and gastritis, which means an inflammation of the stomach. Um, Cryptosporidium serpentis, predominant, which is the main crypto that we see in snakes, predominantly causes those signs. Now in lizards, crypto is much more commonly entrotropic. So we typically see, rather than regurgitation, although we can still see regurgitation and vomiting, but we more typically will see things like diarrhea, um, signs that are related to the intestines, the lower gastrointestinal tract. With both um, types of crypto, um, we see weight loss. And that's one of the hallmarks. And that's one of the first things you'll notice is that the animals will just gradually be losing condition. I guess the most common species that we see crypto in is the leopard gecko. And crypto is also called stick tail disease in leopard geckos. And, you know, the clue is in the name. It basically causes them to get very, very thin. And instead of having a lovely, nice thick tail, they end up with a very, very skinny tail. Prevention. The best way to prevent it coming into your collection actually is with quarantine and actually trying to isolate it if it does come in rather than trying to clean up after it if that makes sense. Um, F10 is 
a very good broad spectrum disinfectant. It won't, as far as I'm aware, kill cryptosporidium. There may be an element of good disinfection of smooth surfaces and the actual mechanical wiping of smooth surfaces, even if you don't use something that will kill the crypto, it might be that you physically remove a lot of the oocysts. But I think in general, um, quarantine the animal ideally in a sort of less expensive setup. I mean, a setup that worst case scenario, you could probably dispose of if you found there was a horrible infectious disease that came into your collection. And then do exactly that if that if worst case scenario that happens, rather than contaminate equipment that will be difficult for you to get rid of. Um, there are some disinfectants available which are oocidal. So oocysts obviously are the sort of immature stage of coccidial type organisms and cryptosporidium. Most disinfectants won't kill oocysts, some will. Um, so there's an oocidal disinfectant that I often recommend called intercocask. Now, intercocask is available. It's, um, it's used widely in agriculture. Um, it's commonly used for sort of poultry house disinfection because poultry get coccidiosis, which is similar to crypto. Um, but even that's not 100% fail safe. Um, so that might reduce the numbers of oocysts. Um, but it may not completely clear all of them. Having good hygiene is really important if you've got it in your collection and you know you've got it, because if you keep things clean, then the, the sort of oocysts will not build up in the environment. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think I would just reiterate, quarantine is the most important thing. Testing and disease screening. So with the faecal sampling being unreliable, is this because the oocysts are being intermittently shed? Yes, exactly. So the oocysts are not reliably shed with every defecation. Um, so you can get some defecations that aren't necessarily contaminated. And if you look at one of those defecations, you might be lulled into a false sense of security and think actually there aren't any crypto oocysts when there may be some. Um, I think if you're relying on faecal testing, there's... Um, definitely an argument to say that sort of a pooled sample, uh, maybe with some feces collected over three days rather than just one day, um, may be a good idea. Um, or alternatively, repeat sampling. So testing a fecal, say, twice or three times whilst the animal is in quarantine. Um, if you have got a snake which is showing signs, for example, it's consistently regurgitating, then get a gastric wash done and get some PCR testing done. Um, to see if that's what you're what you're dealing with. Um, in terms of the testing, so um, you can visualize crypto in the feces. You have to stain the feces with something called a modified Zeal Nielsen test. And that is something that a lot of labs will do routinely when you submit a routine fecal. Um, but it's not 100%. You do get quite a lot of false negatives that way. Um, the PCR testing is better, um, but if it's a gastrotropic species of crypto, then it would be much better to do a PCR test on a stomach sample than it would on a fecal sample, if that makes sense. Um, but I think there's a lot to be said for testing and quarantine as far as crypto is concerned. Keep it out um, rather than try and deal with it if you get it. Um, but actually, the gold standard way that you would diagnose crypto is with histology. So, you, so you'd so look at the stomach wall under the microscope, um, but usually that's something that you're doing post-mortem um, because there's quite a lot of risks with collecting a sample in a living animal. So go faecals first, and then if you're not getting positive results, yet you still think it has it, go to the vet for a stomach wash. Yes, and then if it dies and you've got other animals you're worried about, get a post-mortem done and get histology done. Treatment possibilities. So if your animal does have this, let's say you've done everything right and you're quarantined, but now you have this animal that has crypto, is there any options for treatment or what is uh, lifelong care like? Cryptosporidium is a very challenging disease to treat and many texts will say that you can't treat it. And that probably is to some extent true. Um, as far as I'm aware, there's no treatment that will reliably cure crypto. Um, there are some treatments that have been used to knock it back and to suppress it. 
And in some cases, those animals can have a reasonable quality of life if there's a positive response to treatment for quite a long period of time. Um, perhaps even, you know, almost the normal amount of time in some cases. Um, with, but with those animals, you often have to hit them really hard in the beginning with often several weeks of antibiotics. And then it might be that you need to do intermittent courses or pulses of antibiotics throughout the animal's life to keep them on the straight and narrow. Um, the antibiotic that most is most widely described as being effective is an antibiotic called paromamycin, um, which is an, an, an antibiotic, it's a type of antibiotic called an aminoglycoside antibiotic. It's a reasonably sort of what we'd say is a top shelf antibiotic. It's not an antibiotic that we've used widely or definitely not as a first line for most things. Um, paromamycin is a little bit challenging to get hold of sometimes. It's not widely manufactured and sometimes you can source it, but sometimes you can't. So sometimes that may not be an option because it's not available. There are manufacturing shortages in, in your country and certainly in the UK, paromamycin is, can be quite difficult to get hold of sometimes. Um, paromamycin has been shown to really sort of knock crypto back um, and definitely buy the animal a lot of time. But um, to the best of my knowledge, has not consistently or reliably shown um, that it can clear or cure crypto. And most of those animals remain carriers. And, you know, uh, it may be that with time, they continue to, to lose weight longer term, particularly, you know, if treatment is, is stopped and it's not carried on intermittently, you know, for, for the rest of the animal's life. There are a few other treatments that have been used, but with much more sparing success. Um, so there's a drug called azithromycin, which has been used, um, has been shown to successfully treat crypto in certain other species, like in owls, believe it or not. Um, um, but there's no good evidence that it really sort of is, is particularly effective in reptiles, although it has been used and some people report some success. Um, the other thing is an, is a sort of a sulfonamide antibiotic, so something like sulfatrim, which is actually licensed for the treatment of coccidiosis in beardies in the UK. Um, sulfatrim is widely available, but um, and some people use it to attempt to treat crypto, but its uh, efficacy, I would say, is, is very sparing, um, and we don't really often have very good success. Um, sadly, you know, cryptosporidio cryptosporidiosis is one of those diseases that, you know, you want to try and prevent rather than treat. And if you've got it in a collection, if you bring it in and you think there's, there's sort of other animals in the collection that could be affected, um, I, I would sadly often, you know, advise euthanasia um, to try and protect those other animals rather than trying to treat something that you're unlikely to be able to cure and which you know, may lead to the animal succumbing longer term, if that makes sense. There's not a particularly happy ending, unfortunately. It's not a disease that's very easy for us to treat as veterinary professionals and can be very frustrating. I hope this does raise awareness that we really need to be testing for a lot of things. I think the next disease that I'm going to be going into is nidovirus. So I'm quite looking forward to reach, researching that in a lot of detail. If the opportunity is there, I'm going to animate things like this. I'm looking to keep the entire playlist at the same level of quality. So I'm going to have the owners of labs in. I'm going to have vets in again. Luckily, Tarek and Mary have agreed to help me with this project. So going forward... I hope people stick around to learn more about diseases and if you haven't already subscribed this will be the time to do so to keep tabs on this channel when these disease videos come out and hopefully this motivates anyone that is not actually testing at the moment to start rigorously testing.